Arthur Compton and the other physicists knew what had happened to the earlier experimenters with radioactive materials. Compton chose Robert Stone in Berkeley and Joseph Hamilton at Chicago to research the biological aspects. The scientists who conducted these experiments were not from the inner sanctum trying to build the bomb. They reported their findings directly to them. Joseph Hamilton began to study the radiation effects in rats in the summer of 1942. In 1943, the first human test subjects would be used without their knowledge or consent. All the experiments were conducted for the express purpose of answering the unknowns. How much radiation would kill a man? Could blood tests detect exposure? Are there treatments for exposure? Long before radiological warfare was used on enemy populations in war, it was purposefully tested on American citizens. By 1945, the war was over, but these questions remained unanswered. The experiments would have to continue for the next 30 years. Admiral James Cooney became the leading advocate for an experiment on 200 healthy volunteers using up to 150 rad or more. Colonel Shields Warren opposed the idea, as did other civilian scientists. He argued that 200 was too small a number to base a study on. A real study would have to include 10,000 or more subjects. While this argument raged, the School of Aviation Medicine in San Antonio, Texas, quietly began to do the test for the Air Force. Randolph Lee Clark, the director of MD Anderson, oversaw the first study irradiating sick cancer patients with hundreds of rads using TBI or total body irradiation. Human subjects were chosen with tumors that did not respond to treatment with radiation. Patients that would have been helped by radiation would have shown altered levels of blood cells, amino acids, enzymes, plasma proteins, and lipids that would have clouded the results in the search for a biological dosimeter. Colonel Shields Warren did not object to the use of cancer patients, but too many of these people were not very ill or had been misdiagnosed. At least two of the 20 people injected with plutonium had been mis misdiagnosed as having cancer when they did not. Many of the others were not cancer patients, but suffered from illnesses such as scleroderma or Cushing's disease. These errors were repeated in the TBI experiments that were sponsored by the military. Many of the cancer patients had been well enough to work and live normally. After doses of 100 to 2,000 rad, many died within days or weeks and had, in fact, been killed by radiation poisoning. Those that lived were often debilitated and in constant pain. Surprisingly or not, 34 Nazi scientists were employed at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio and involved in these lethal experiments. These were just a few of the thousands of Nazi scientists who had secretly been smuggled into the U.S. under Operation Paperclip to help the U.S. destroy the USSR. Dr. Hubertus Strughold was their intellectual and spiritual leader in radiation studies. He brought in Dr. Herbert Gerstner, who had used human subjects during the war to study at what point human hearing is completely destroyed due to explosions from shelling. He also used people to study the exact cause of death in cases of electrocution. He found that death resulted from a tremendous increase in blood pressure that forced blood from the peripheral vessels into the heart and abdominal cavity. These men had all experimented on Jews, gypsies, intellectuals, homosexuals, allied prisoners of war, and others, and they were now in San Antonio doing lethal total body irradiation experiments on American citizens for the military. The Nazi paperclip scientist Gerstner and Eugene Sanger collaborated on the TBI studies. Gerstner did the first one and Sanger did the last one. The locations included MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Sloan Kettering in New York, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee between the years 1951 and 1974, studying about 500 patients. The TBI experiments were only a subset of the radiation experiments on human subjects that included plutonium injections, radioactive isotope studies, and many others. 
Vanderbilt University Hospital Prenatal Clinic hosted 850 pregnant women to a secret study using radioactive isotopes iron-55 and iron-59. The pregnant women were given a cocktail and told it was vitamins for their unborn child. Free health care was the lure used on the economically disadvantaged women. Helen Hutchison was six months pregnant and visited the clinic in July 1946 seeking treatment for nausea. She was given a cocktail by the doctors and told to drink it that it would make her feel better. Several months after the birth of her daughter, her hair fell out and she developed blisters, anemia, and later had life-threatening complications after several miscarriages. Her daughter Barbara was always tired as a child, developed an, an immune system disorder and skin cancer. Many of the mothers and children exposed to radioactive iodine developed strange afflictions, rashes, anemia, blood disorders, and cancer. Paul Hahn, the principal investigator in the study, was a protege of Stafford Warren and had worked with Robley Evans. Hahn wrote the Iron 55 with a half-life of five years was too hazardous to be given to humans and had no therapeutic value, yet he used it in the study, which was partially funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Helen Hutchison's husband had landed in Europe on D-Day and had personally helped liberate Buchenwald concentration camp. The Nazi doctors who worked in the camp may have been some of the very men who participated in the radiation experiment on his wife and unborn child. One study conducted at the Fernald State School in Waltham, Massachusetts used radioactive iodine and calcium secretly given to 74 orphans in their oatmeal using the ruse of a nutrition study. Robley Evans produced the radioactive isotopes in the MIT cyclotron and supervised the experiment. The lure used by the MIT scientist was membership in a science club that went on school outings to baseball games and even Christmas parties at the MIT faculty club. The scientists may not have believed that the amount of radiation involved was harmful, but they would have not allowed this experiment to be conducted on their own families. At Washington State Penitentiary and Oregon State Prison, about 200 prisoners had their testicles irradiated with 8 to 600 rads with the lure of a little money and extra privileges. Carl Heller was one of the world's leading endocrinologists and his protege C. Alvin Paulson ran the two studies from 1963 until 1971. These and similar experiments on thousands of people continued for 30 years in the vain search for a biological dosimeter. The ultimate identities and fates of the test subjects will never be known. Most went to their graves never knowing they had been used as human guinea pigs by the Elmer government. Allen was designated experimental test subject Cal-13. On July 18, 1947, in a San Francisco hospital, he was injected with plutonium in the left leg. Three days later, the leg was amputated at mid-thigh. Elmer was a porter for the Pullman Company who injured his leg while stepping off a train. He was diagnosed with a fracture that developed into a cyst. The first test for cancer was negative. The second test indicated cancer. Unable to work, he was forced to return to Italy, Texas with his wife and three children after the operation. His wife recalled that he began having epileptic seizures. He would chew through the spoon, his tongue too. Elmer began drinking heavily and told his best friend that he had been used as a guinea pig, but no one, not even his family doctor, believed him. The doctor later diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic. During an effort to collect the bodies of the people injected with plutonium, it was discovered to their amazement that four of these people were still alive. In 1943, Austin Buse from the Center for Human Radiobiology wrote to Elmer and asked him to be in a metabolism study. He and his wife were brought to Chicago and Elmer's urine and feces were collected for two weeks as he stayed in the hospital.